And if there is none, I will present the next speaker who is going to give you an insight, insightful talk, and that's Dr. Michelle Lewis. So Michelle is going to talk to us about physician's wellness, and um, she's really the right person to, to cover this topic because in her current role at the um, internal medicine residency program as the director at Mayo Clinic Florida. She had um, more than 51 residents, right? Yes. And then, um, so do you keep them sane? And then she received multiple awards. I can't even name all of them. Distinguished educator at the Mayo Clinic. She won the teaching award in gastroenterology 11 years in a row. So you must have some secret sauce recipe. I paid them. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, without further. Thank you. I'm going to keep the microphone. Thank you and welcome all of the fellows and residents in the audience. This meeting is really about you. Hopefully you can pull up my slides. I think I saw them a minute ago. My son. No. Do you have my slides? Um, they do have your slides. We did go through them before. I see. Okay. You can sing a little bit. Oh, absolutely. I'm actually better at tap dancing. <laughs> I can come and have I can stand next to you. Do you do salsa dancing? Uh, no, salsa, no. Okay. <laughs> no. going to keep it going. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I've been involved with MPF for a long, long time. I actually was a GI fellow at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston when the MPF started, and one of the co-founders, Jane Holt, was one of my patients at the time. I love MPF. I love their focus on patient care, education, research. They have the whole picture. Um, I really appreciate the fact that they include residents and fellows every year for this fellow symposium. They raise money aggressively to be able to send you guys all here to meet um, for a weekend every year. And that's something really special. That comes from a need that we have in the pancreas field for younger people to take the torch from us as older mentors and continue research and education and clinical care in the field of pancreatology. There, the reason I got interested in pancreatology, there's so many things that we don't know. Um, so hopefully this weekend, you'll think of ideas, you'll, you'll find mentors, you'll, you'll hear things uh, where you can take this torch back to your home institution and continue this field. No? Okay. So the mission of this weekend. So to encourage you to pursue a career focus in pancreatic disease. Um, also to facilitate the interaction that you have with senior investigators. Provide knowledge and state of the art of where we are now in pancreatology and what we need to learn, where we need to go with the field, and to partner also with community leaders and patients to get this done. The MPF started in 2006, so a long time ago. Um, the, in 2009, we actually started talking about wellness. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, we had a guest speaker come and talk about optimism and resiliency way back in 2009. And in 2018, last year, we finally made it to my home state of Florida. Um, so thank you very much for coming in this warm environment. Hopefully it'll be raining and you won't be tempted to go to the beach this weekend and you'll stay for all of our talks. <laughs> So what are my qualifications, as full disclosure, talking about physician wellness? Number one, I'm a physician. I've lived it. I've done it. And number two, I'm willing to talk about it. Not many of us are willing to talk about what are the struggles? What are the negatives of being a physician? What are the, the obstacles that we faced? What are the barriers? Um, so one of, one of my qualifications of talking about this I came through medical school and residency before there were any duty hour regulations. Um, the generation though before me, I promise you, and the generation before that generation, and the generation before that generation had it even harder than I did. You know, you're called residents for a reason. At one point we lived in the hospital. This is where the name residents came from. We lived in the hospital, we were not allowed to be married, we had to be male, and we lived in the hospital. So as hard as you think you have it now, just think back so many generations ago, it was so much harder. But that's not to say that you don't have it very hard now. 
Um, what are my other qualifications? Oh, sorry. I do wear the hat of program director, so I interact with residents all the time. I understand uh, the challenges with residency and fellowship. Um, we have tried in our program in internal medicine residency at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville to be on the forefront of wellness and resiliency training. We've actually won several national awards in this arena. Uh, we've produced very innovative ideas with incl including arts and humanities in our curriculum, uh, with cl including a lot of, of wellness type activities in our curriculum that we've been awarded for. Um, I think that just makes common sense. I don't know that we needed to be awarded for that, but hopefully all of your training programs, wherever you are now as a resident or fellow, have some wellness incorporated into that curriculum. What is wellness? Um, some people say it's the opposite of depression and suicide. I'm not sure that's really what wellness is. I think if you're depressed or suicidal, you definitely are not well, but wellness should be much more than that. This was a slide. I took a picture of this from my cell phone in the audience at the ACGME meeting in 2016. Dr. Tom Naska, the president of ACGME, was the first to really describe what is the problem we're facing in medicine. This is a, a slide of suicidality. So it's very hard up probably for you guys to read, but the red bars are physicians, the blue bars are dentists, and the black bars are the general population. This is a population of male Caucasians, physicians, uh, going forward, but it represents basically all of us in medicine. If you can see, once you hit 45, physicians now pass dentists and all other occupations in suicide rates. So 45 and up, we're the highest group of suicide physicians. That's our group. I'm 51 years old. That's my generation. That's all the generations before me. We're the highest rates of suicides. We've now passed dentists. So what does that say? When you look at the younger generations, it's a, it's a small group. Um, you know, you start out and you're not suicidal. At some point, you hit 45 and older, and it's an extremely high suicide rate. What does that mean? We didn't have duty hour regulations when we were younger. We weren't trained in resiliency. So does that have any bearing on, on how we handle life now? Possibly, those are lessons that we need to learn. But it's interesting that now ACGME requirements um, dictate that we talk about wellness in our training programs, but we're the blind leading the blind. So we as mentors have this horrible track record of depression and suicide, yet we're now told that we have to be the role models for young people and how not to be depressed and suicidal. And it's absolutely crazy. No one ever told us as we were going through training that it's important to take care of yourself. It's important to be focused on your family. It's important to keep up your hobbies. It's important to take care of just the things in life outside of medicine. That was not a focus of our training. And now we're seeing what happens when that happens, but we're asked to be the role models for you guys. So this is a talk not only for residents and fellows, but for the mentors in the crowd. Because maybe no one ever told you, you need to take care of your family. You need to take care of yourself. You need to be good to yourself. You need to listen to that inner voice that tells you what you need, and that's important, and that's valuable. And we need to role model that for younger generations, and we need to do a better job than what maybe our mentors did for us. This is an article that Dr. Tom Naska, the president of ACGME, published um, several years ago. They looked at 15 years of what caused deaths during residency training. And by residents, they also include fellows. So residents or fellows during 15 years, 2000 to 2014, um, 324 residents in the United States died during that period of time and what caused their deaths. The number one cause of deaths in males in residency and, or in fellowship was suicide. The number one cause in females was malignancy, but the number two cause was suicide. So male residents and fellows, the number one cause of death during residency and fellowship is suicide. And if you look at the quarters of the year and when that happens, it's, it's, it's predictable. 
It's the first year of anything. So the first year of medical school, the first year of residency, the first year of fellowship, the first year of faculty um, has the highest risk of that happening. Also the third quarter, so in the winter months, um, when things are, are also kind of dark and gloomy, depression rates are higher, um, that's also the highest risk of suicides. So the first quarter and the first year of anything is a risk. We need to be aware of this. We need to know this for our trainees. We need to, to be looking for, for warning signs when this happens. There's actually a burnout survey that's been validated. It's called the Copenhagen uh, Burnout Survey. So several questions about personal and work-related burnout. I'm gonna ask you these questions. I want you to think about this quietly in your own minds as I'm asking these questions. How often do you feel tired? How often are you physically exhausted? How often are you emotionally exhausted? How often do you think, I can't take it anymore? How often do you feel worn out? How often do you feel weak and susceptible to illness? And at work, do you feel worn out at the end of your work day? Are you exhausted in the morning before you even get to work to start the work day? Do you feel that every working hour is tiring for you? And do you have enough energy at the end of your work day to interact with your family and friends um, and go forward with your life. Loneliness. This is an area that's just now beginning to be studied, connected to burnout, but loneliness is a huge problem in physicians. It's a huge problem in physicians in training. It's hard to believe. Think about when you go to DDW and there are 15,000 gastroenterologists from around the world at DDW and you're sitting in these meetings and you're literally surrounded by thousands of people. How many of you have ever felt lonely when you're sitting at that meeting though. You're surrounded by your colleagues. These are your peers. These are people who have gone the same path you've gone. And they're all here to hear the same message. But how many of you feel lonely at that time and not included? There's a significant number of us who feel lonely. And that's a huge problem. They're starting to look at loneliness. I'm sorry for the clicker. At loneliness related to burnout. Loneliness questions though, how often do you feel lack of companionship? How often do you feel left out? How often do you feel isolated from others? So you give yourself one point if you say hardly ever, you give yourself two points if sometimes, and you give yourself three points if often. And there are studies that show that residents' significant burnout rates are found to have higher loneliness scores. So if you, your total scores are 5.6 versus 4.5 if you're also burnt out and you're lonely. We can be lonely sitting in a group of people like we are tonight. The first thing you do when you walk into a room like this with your colleagues, you look for someone you know. You look for that connection with loneliness. Mammals are social beings. We're all built, our DNA, to be in groups. What happens to a wolf if it's isolated from the pack? It usually dies. It's by itself, it can't get food, it doesn't have companionship, it's by itself. What happens to us if we're not in groups? We're, it's, it's hardwired in our DNA, DNA, we're supposed to be in social groups. We look for each other, we look for that support system. It helps us find food, it helps us find shelter, it helps us find companionship. We're hardwired to be in groups. Loneliness is a big problem that we don't appreciate. We need to reach out to each other. We need to make each other feel included. We need to feel welcomed when we come to society meetings or when we come to interactions with each other. We need to feel connected. And that's a huge problem with burnout that's just now beginning to be studied. What are our barriers? There are emotional, physical, and financial barriers, certainly, for wellness. Emotional barriers, you guys are young, you know? You don't have those life experiences. Think about when you're a teenager, your first love breaks up with you, um, your first friend doesn't wanna talk to you on social media, you feel like the world is over. This is it, you know, in game, this is it, I'm, I'm no good anymore. And then as you go through life, you realize you'll make new friends, you'll find a new partner, things will be okay. 
Um, you learn that through experiences. But when you're young, you don't have that. You don't have that experience. You don't have that background to go on. So it's very difficult. There's a stigma with mental health. How many of you have state licensure boards that ask you, have you ever have a mental health disorder? Have you ever been on medications for mental health problems? Have you ever seen a psychiatrist? I mean, we're trying to do away with those questions because number one, if you identify that you have a mental health disorder and you get help, good for you. That means you're a stronger physician. That means you're doing exactly what you should do. That's not a bad thing. So we're trying to get a, do away with those questions as being a stigma or being a negative in the field of medicine. We as physicians should know better than anyone else, mental health issues are biochemical issues. They're real health problems. They're problems in our patients. They're problems that we have. So we need to embrace those and move forward. And as medical trainees, we move around a lot. We lose our support systems. So you move someplace from college to medical school to residency to fellowship to your first job. You leave your support systems. Your family is five states away or a thousand miles away. You move away from them. So that's not healthy. You don't have a support system. You need to build new support systems. And those are things that you have to actively do. And we need to actually, as mentors, help you do that better. Physical, so you also, as you move from place to place to place, you lose your primary care physician. You lose those physicians who help you take care of yourself. Financial, this is crazy, okay? You guys are the smartest people on the planet. You guys are the smartest people finishing high school. You've done all the right things. You haven't chosen drugs. You haven't chosen all these other bad habits. You've chosen all the right things in life. You've made straight A's in school. You've gone straight through school. You haven't wasted any time. You go through medical school, college. You end up with $190,000 of debt. You owe this to the government. You're paying at most sometimes 7% interest to the government for your education. How crazy is that? These are the brightest people in our country, the brightest people on the planet. We do not need to be charging you and making money on you on interest for your medical education. This is something we have to change. We have to be on the forefront of advocacy programs to change this in our, in our institutions, in our, in our country. Um, medical school debt now is out of control. So that's something that you all need to be very vocal about. Doctors are not vocal. We're not advocates. We vote 9% less than attorneys vote when it comes to elections. We need to vote. We need to be advocates. We need to say this has to stop. Like I said, you're very special. You guys are the smartest of the smart. You're the best people we have in our society. You make all the right decisions. You sacrifice. You don't go to parties on the weekends. You do homework. You do write papers. You do all the right things in life. Um, you make tons of sacrifices in your personal and professional life. You are very, very special. Just having an MD or a PhD behind your name when you go to buy a car, when you go to get a bank account, when you go to buy a house, People automatically respect you. Anyone who sees that you're a physician will give you respect. Now, you can, you can break that, and you can do something that, that, that might disappoint them, and they don't respect you anymore, but they automatically give you the benefit of the doubt because you have an MD or a PhD behind your name. They automatically assume that you're a good person, that you're smart, and that you're hardworking, and that you're responsible, and that's a gift. And you guys need to realize that. You have that. So don't mess that up. So live up to that. Help each other with that. Um, but also don't take that for granted. You're young. You have the whole world ahead of you. You can make a difference. But are you happy? And will you be happy in the long run? Or will your generation be like our generation and have the highest suicide rates in the country? This is what we don't know. We don't know that now that we limit duty hour regulations and now that we focus on wellness and training, hopefully your generation will not be our generation and the generations before us. And you won't be a higher suicide rate than dentists and everyone else. But we don't know that yet. So what do you need? Personal wellness, so health. 
In our residency program, we actually started last year making an appointment with a primary care physician for every resident, every new intern that came into our program. We automatically scheduled them with a primary care physician in family medicine, because we're an internal medicine residency, so don't, we don't want you to see an internal medicine doctor that's going to be your attending one day. We actually scheduled you with a family medicine doctor before you even start residency. So the first week, two weeks of residency, you have an appointment with a new primary care doctor, so you can always opt out if you don't want to see that person, but we automatically make that as a default for you because you need a primary care physician. I, I think I was 45 years old before I had a primary care physician. I had two children. I saw OBGYNs for my children, but I never had a primary care physician until I was probably 45, 46 years old. Um, you don't need to do that. You need a primary care physician. You need to think about preventive health. You need to make sure you're getting your immunizations. You need to be sure that you're getting up with all of your um, appointments. ACGME now has it as a core requirement. Did you guys know this? You can actually leave work for dentist appointments and medical appointments. And your, your program director has to let you go. So if they don't let you go, you report that on your ACGME survey every year. But that is a core requirement of ACGME that you can go to medical appointments. Find your employee resource groups. Employee resource groups have um, counseling that's for free at almost every employer. You need to find those. Hobbies, continue those during your residency and fellowship. Your environment, you need to seek out mentors who will support you and have your best interest in mind. And you need to develop that supportive friend group. For your career, know your skill set. Don't try to be someone you're not. Find your passion and follow that passion. And work-life balance. So work-life balance assumes it's going to be 50-50. That's not always the, the thing. So you may be starting your career. You may be near retirement. You may be single with no children. You may be single with children. You may be married with no children. You may be married with children. That 50-50 balance is not always 50-50. Sometimes you have to take care of yourself and your family more. Sometimes after yourself and your family um, are set, you can take care of your career more. But it's not always a 50-50 balance. Here are some of the things we do in my residency. Um, I don't know, the pictures showed out, showed out here, but we have arts and humanities. How many of you guys have a history of art, music, uh, sculpture, theater? Anybody with a history of that? When you were in high school, when you were in college, how many of you let it go when you were in medical school because you were just too busy? That's not what you want to do. You want to continue those hobbies. Those make you who you are. Those are very important. I don't think the picture showed out, so I'll keep going. Don't sweat the small stuff. So lots of things in your life is a continuous evolution. Um, you have to adapt to ever-changing situations. So you need the discipline to prioritize what's important in your life at the time, but also the wisdom to compromise. And that's something you get with experience. But just keep moving forward. Never take yourself too seriously. My Department of Medicine chair told me recently that one of the most important things he ever learned in a leadership conference was to just let things go. You guys all know that you've made mistakes. You've all said things you didn't mean to say. You've sent an email that was a little too, you know, um, maybe confrontational and you feel badly about it. You just need to let it go. And he actually showed me this at a morning report this past week where he actually puts his, his hand to his temple and he just says, let it go. And you just need to do that. Sometimes when you beat yourself up so many times about doing the wrong thing, you just need to let it go, let it go. It's okay, you're a good person, let that go. I give you a challenge this weekend. Be thankful and be humble. Be humble. How many times has a physician told you to do that? Be humble. Don't be arrogant. Don't think you know everything. Don't think you're the expert on every topic that comes up because you're not. We're, none of us are. No one knows everything about everything. Medicine, if it does anything, it teaches us that we need to be humble. 
Every time you think you've seen every single case of how acute pancreatitis presents or pancreas cancer presents, a patient will come in and prove you wrong. Medicine constantly humbles us. So be humble and be kind to each other, okay? That's a challenge for this weekend. Be fully engaged, okay? Listen, pay attention to these mentors. Like they said, they've come here, they've given their time, free of charge, listen to them. Always take the high road, always be honest, do the right thing. No matter what the leaders on our political level in our country are showing you as a role model, you need to do the right thing. You need to always be honest, always say things that are honest, take the high road. So this weekend, learn about the pancreas. I honestly believe it's the soul of the body. I believe it has been uh, through evolution, the pancreas is the hardest organ to get to. It's protected by soft tissues. It's protected by other things. If you mess with it, it reacts like no other organ. It is the soul of your body. So please, this weekend, think of it like that. Think of one new thing you can do. Write it down, make new friends, create new contacts, and introduce yourself to mentors. This weekend is all about you, so please do not be shy about introducing yourself to mentors, asking questions. When you get back home, the number one lesson that you're gonna learn from all of our talks this weekend is don't mess with the pancreas. There's, been an, there's another verb that's been put in that place before that's also appropriate, but don't mess with the pancreas. Correspond with the new friends that you meet here this weekend. Try to start a collaboration of some new project. And please, apply to come back next year. We love it when you come back year after year. And next year, bring a new friend. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Michelle. If, if any of you guys have any questions, we have room for one or two, maybe. If not, I have one. So if we notice that a colleague or a, a trainee is burnt out, what should be the first thing we do or encourage them to do? That's a great question. Um, absolutely. Number one, you need to be in tune with your colleagues. You guys know each other. You guys know each other. You spend more time with each other than probably your significant others spend with you. So you know if someone comes to work and maybe they look like they're a little disheveled, they haven't taken a shower in a few days, maybe they haven't slept well in a few days, they're just edgy, you know, they, they are snippy with a nurse, um, their fuse is really short, Number one, don't think negatively of that person. Don't think that's a bad person or that's a bad character trait. The first thing you should think about is something's going on with that person behind the scenes. Something's going on in their private life that's not right. They haven't had enough sleep. Maybe they're mentally, physically sick. Uh, maybe something's going on. So don't think, don't jump to the negative. Think, jump to how can I help that person? Maybe they need some time off. And as program directors, we have a lot of flexibility. You know, we can give you time off. We can give you sick days um, and not tell anyone what that's about. So I do that all the time as a program director. No one needs to know that you need mental health days or fatigue days off. Um, but if you need those, you need those. And those are real problems. And hopefully by taking those and by taking care of yourself, you're not going to be a statistic on that curve when you're 45 or 50 or 60 with the highest suicide rate in the country. So take that time for yourself. And if you see your colleague struggling, assume something is seriously going on, something's really wrong, they need time for themselves. Tell your program directors, tell your mentors, talk to them. Um, but we're your advocates as in education. And so please speak up about that. In our generation, we were not encouraged to do that. We were encouraged to put your nose to the grindstone and just don't complain and keep working. And it was a weakness to complain and not keep working. And you see where that's ended us up. So we need to speak up. Thank you, Michelle. It's, it's a true thing that when you see a colleague or a friend go through that, it's eye-opening how we should all be cognizant and support each other. And really, um, we find more support in each other than just letting each, uh, each other fail. So thank you for that. If there's any more questions, we're going to do some introductions.
Okay, so we're going to go around the room, and this is really the fun and most relaxing end. By, and after that, we just open it to networking. We're going to go from table to table. Um, we would want you to tell us what's your name, which institution you came from, and um, a fun fact about yourself that probably no one else knows. And if you already told us in a previous meeting, that's okay. We forgot, so you can repeat it again. Um, I start with myself. My name is Maisam Abu El Haija, and as you can tell, my name is very American. <laughs> That's the fun fact. Michelle Lewis, I actually am a tap dancer, and uh, I love to drive fast. Throughout my whole life, I've been two points away from losing my license for speeding tickets. Um, I currently have a Porsche, and I love to drive fast. I'm also a Star Trek fan. And uh, I would love to talk with any of you who think Star Wars is better. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. <laughs> so uh, sorry for getting here late. Uh, you missed my talk. I know. That's, uh, that's a sad thing. I know. What can I say? So my name is Roberto Gugig. Um, uh, I work at Stanford now. And uh, fun fact about me, I played baseball A and AA for the Texas Rangers before my medical Ooh. career. <laughs> And he's a pediatric ERCP endoscopist. Woo! <laughs> so I'm Veronique Mournville. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist also, um, I, and I'm from Montreal, uh, Canada. A couple of uh, fun facts, you know, we're talking about keeping hobbies going. I used to be more of an artist, but lately with the family, we've done that. This will age me also. I don't know if you guys remember an old PBS show, that guy Bob Ross used to do painting. So they have them on Netflix. And like we all sit for all four of us, you know, next to the painting and see who can reproduce the best happy trees. That's one thing. Two, as you were talking, I don't know who is Game of Thrones fans, but as she was mentioning about the wolf, the lone wolf dies and a pack survives, I'm like, that's like the Stark family motto. So anyways, um, three episodes left and we'll all be back Sunday night to watch one. Thank you. you play it here. <laughs> I'm Jamie Nathan from Cincinnati Children's. I'm a pediatric transplant surgeon. Um, fun fact about me, in 1994, um, I was a driver in President Bill Clinton's motorcade. Kind of random, but I was asked to be a driver in his motorcade when he came to visit New Haven, Connecticut. Um, but exactly. <laughs> Bill Clinton. Had Bill Clinton behind me. <laughs> I'm Bargava Malipudi.